Randy Kay here. We all go through struggles at times, and I want to share with you through stories and insights and interviews with others how much God loves you. He loves you immensely, and that's what I hope you will hear through our interviews and what we have to share with you. Thanks for staying tuned. Here we go. Welcome to this episode of Revelations from Heaven. I'm going to be interviewing uh, a young man who died as a child in a pool accident. He has a vivid recollection of that, but more importantly was his encounter after dying from drowning in that pool. And we'll talk about how a child's perspective carries on into adulthood so that we can understand Jesus more clearly and we can understand heaven more clearly. So uh, my guest, Liam Bielek, he is with us and it's great to have you, Liam. Thanks so much. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm excited. So, Well, it, it's going to be our pleasure because your story is very unique in that you're going to be telling us from both a child's perspective, but also how you process that through the years. Obviously, you're, um, you're a grown man now, and there was, a, there was a period of time that it took uh, you to adjust kind of this and, you know, with friends and who you were telling and what it all meant and all of that. And what's interesting, I think, Liam, is that we have learned through our experiences in interviewing a number of people now that it takes a number of years actually to process the experience. In other words, when it first happens, it's just almost too overwhelming. Uh, so we have a unique perspective from you, but give us an, an indication at this point, what your childhood was like, uh, your family, uh, siblings, things of that nature. Yeah, absolutely. So I grew up in a family with two siblings, two older brothers. I'm the youngest of three. So I had a brother named Shane and a brother named Colin. Uh, we're all split by three years. So my next oldest is three. And then the oldest above me is six years older than me. Uh, I was raised in a Catholic church uh, from when I was born to all the way to now. Uh, born and raised in Brighton, Michigan. Went to the same church my entire life. Uh, I was raised in a kind of like a, a military family dynamic. My, my dad served in the military for a number of years. Uh, my brother served, both my brothers serve. Uh, and this is a, uh, it, it was, it's kind of like a, uh, how do I say this? Um, it, it's a neat dynamic because it's, it's more of like a, I don't know where I'm going with this. It's hard to explain. Uh, it's, it's a strict but welcoming family because we centered it around Christ, right? Uh, so growing up, I was, it was, you know, follow the rules, but you know, your Bible's at your right hand at the same time, be able to repent and confess for your sins and whatnot. Um, so that's basically kind of how I was raised. Uh, like I said, it was, it was a very Christian oriented family going to church every Sunday, um, that kind of family dynamic. Yeah. Well, it sounds like, um, you know, strong family certainly, and maybe, fairly regimented family. Yes, sir. Uh, so, <laughs> okay. So you're growing up in a, in an area north of Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, which is again, uh, kind of a, you know, ideal family oriented area and life is, is going about smoothly. I mean, you're a kid, yeah. normal kid going about different things. You have a pool in the backyard and you have your older uh, siblings as well. I assume you, uh, the family use the pool fairly often, at least in the uh, spring or summertime. So, um, so tell us about that fateful day when uh, you were a three-year-old boy and, um, and what happened? Yeah, so actually it was not our pool. Um, I did not grow up with a pool. Uh, ah. I did uh, grow up on a lake where my our family cottage was at. So uh, there's where I kind of thought I knew how to swim, <laughs> but obviously as a three-year-old. But actually that uh, circumstance happened in Orlando, Florida. We were uh, visiting a fa our, our family friend, someone that my dad flew with in the military. Uh, we were growing up, we went down there 
uh, basically for every spring break, sort of, we'd go and stay with them. And they had a pool just like every other pool or every other house in Orlando, Florida. They all got a pool because it's hot, right? Um, so how that day went by was uh, essentially me being three years old, my next oldest brother, Colin, who was six, me and him were playing by the pool, just kind of playing with toys. Like they had a little toy boat that you know, just throw across the pool, whatever. Um, and the family we were visiting, they had three girls and one of them was a gymnast and she had gotten home from school and was showing the entire family her gymnastic moves. And my brother Colin rushed in there, uh, which left me alone by the pool unknowingly, obviously. Uh, and I had went and I reached for the toy at the side of the pool while I was alone and I fell into the pool. Mm. And you're three years old reaching for a toy. Uh, you didn't have the adults around you supervising at the time. And, correct. and you accidentally fell in the pool. Yep. That's correct. <clears throat> Yeah, so um, you essentially drowned in the pool for a period of about five minutes. Now, five minutes in the pool for anyone um, is the point of, you know, generally speaking, the heart would be would stop at this point, which is the definition of clinical death. Um, who discovered you uh, when you were uh, drowned in the pool? So it was one of the girls, her name was Bree. I called her Bree Bree back then because so I was a little three-year-old. So she was Bree Bree. Uh, they told me that she uh, asked where I was at and she walked towards the pool and she had screamed. Um, and that's at the moment when they realized I was at the bottom of the pool. They described it that the pool was glass. So it was clear that I did not fall in recently within obviously probably a minute where, you know, ripples would probably still be settling at the time. Uh, and that's where my mom dove in and grabbed me and they discovered that my skin was navy blue um and initial panic obviously went through the family now navy blue that's that's a dark dark blue so that means that that you were uh without oxygen uh in your blood system for quite a while i mean that's uh, that's not just a pale skin like uh, you know when i was in the hospital my my skin had turned gray, um, but you were actually at that point, uh, you know, you were your heart had stopped. And so who resuscitated you? Yeah. So after my mom pulled me out of the pool, uh, my dad having the military background, he was uh, certified in CPR and everything for medical stuff and whatnot. Uh, so he had began, uh, begun doing CPR mouth to mouth um on me and he says it best he said you know they can teach you how to do cpr but they never teach you how to do it to your own kid so mm. uh while cindy who is the mom of the family that we were down there uh she was on the phone with 911, uh and they were kind of just talking her through what to do and whatnot and they said you know tilt his head back when they're doing mouth to mouth and he was like oh i was blown air into his stomach um because like i said they, he said they never teach you how to do it to your own kid um, so my dad was the one that was working on me. Wow. Well, now something happened when you were in the pool and your body, you know, had given out and, um, you had a special encounter. Tell us about that. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, I remember waking up in a world that was clearly not earth it was substantially different um it was a I, I describe it as like an endless white room if that makes sense not like clouds but like just an endless white room with no ceiling no walls but like just it went on forever sort of thing uh and i remember the first thing i noticed were just the hundreds of toys that were around me just like everything. It was a three-year-old's dream. Like I remember being pretty obsessed with trains when I was three. So like, I remember there was little trains, little trucks, and I was just ecstatic. Wow. So you had no comprehension at that point as a child. I mean, you thought that this, you were in kind of a, like a, a dream state or, but it wasn't a dream, was it? I mean, it was, it was real to you at the time. 
no, yeah, absolutely not. Definitely not a dream. Uh, and it, it's funny that you say kind of like a, a world that you, you don't know, right? Especially as a three-year-old, you think that uh, being somewhere you don't know, your parents aren't around or brothers or somebody that you know that would, you know, make you pretty calm. Uh, and growing up, I was a pretty shy kid. I was a mama's boy. I was always attached to my mom's hip in public and whatnot. But I just remember like feeling completely at peace, like zero fear running through my body. Uh, I was just like, it was that pure joy, that, that pure happiness that like, it's, it's quite literally like indescribable. Uh, there, there was just absolutely no fear running through my body or anything. It was just, it was pure, like pure love, I guess you could describe it as. Do you have any memory of, of drowning actually not being able to breathe? So when I fell into the pool, I think the last thing that I remember is quite literally just falling underwater, like kind of just fading down. And then after that, I, it was just, that's the next thing I remember is waking up in the giant white room surrounded by toys. Wow. So you're surrounded by toys of every kind, trains and all of the things that you love. This is a, a child's dream at this point. And you saw a figure, uh, and it was a figure in the distance, but that figure eventually came close to you. Tell us about that. Yeah, so I remember sitting there playing with the toys and kind of like off to my right, like in the distance, you could see a man that appeared to me as like like a giant almost. Uh, and he was sitting in like a king's throne is how I describe it. Uh, and as I was sitting there playing with the toys and he stood up and he walked towards me, uh, by the time he got to me, he was, he was not a giant. He was what you would call like earthly sized, a, a normal sized human being. Uh, and my eyes were, I was still so fixated on the toys. Like my eyes never came up. Uh, and I just sat there and as he was standing over me, Jesus, uh, I just, I was well-mannered as a kid. I said, thank you. I like, thank you for these toys that you gave me. Like, I, I got to say thanks. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I just kept saying, thank you. Thank you. And, uh, he, he knelt down to me and he put his arm around me and drew my attention away from the toys and towards him. Wow. And you looked into the fa face of Jesus. Yep. So when, when he put his arm around me, I remember just turning my head towards him and just getting lost in his eyes. Just mm. like, it, it's that feeling of like absolutely nothing else mattered in the world. Right. Um, I did. It was just, it was astonishing. Like, it, and it was like, I, I remember he had a beard. He had the long brown hair. He, he, looked like you're what you would expect him to look like, I guess, as far as, uh, let me, I can give an example. Uh, I forget what her name is, but it was a girl who was having visions of Jesus and she drew a painting of him. Um, I forget. She was on TV a couple of times, but I remember seeing that photo years later when I was like 10 and I was like, Holy cow. Like, I know that guy. That's him. <laughs> yeah. Um, She's a Ukrainian. I can't pronounce her name. I always mess yeah, up know, her I name, but <laughs> she was a little child. And I think that people ask, uh, one of the most common questions we hear is, what does he look like? Does he look like that painting? And I think, um, I don't know if we can put it on the screen. That might be copyright uh, infringement. But I think, I, I think people will probably know what that is, the bright blue eyes and the... So what you're saying, the answer to that is um, when you were looking into uh, the eyes of Jesus, the face of Jesus, that it was like that, uh, like that painting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Wow. You know, I, I'm, I'm struck by the fact, Liam, that as a child, you're just absorbed into these toys, right? You want to play these with these toys. But when it came to uh, looking at Jesus and being with Jesus as he's hugging you, uh, that's all you wanted. Uh, the toys seemed irrelevant to you at that point. Yeah, it's. The presence of God. Yeah, that's quite literally the only way to explain it. 
and I still get goosebumps to this day thinking about it. I know, I know how you felt as an adult, but as a child, I think that's what's so incredible about your story, Liam, because you were looking through the, literally through the eyes of a child. Your whole future lie ahead of you if you were to survive, but he had given you, Jesus had given you the desires of your heart. And that's in the book of Psalms, you know, that he gives us the desires of our heart. But also another facet of this that is um, fascinating is that you saw him initially as this giant figure, maybe a little daunting for a child. And then he became very personal in this for a human size individual. What do you think that was about? Yeah. So as an adult, how I interpret that, obviously not going to be able to interpret that as a three-year-old, but as I think about that today, um, you know, like Jesus is God. He's the son of God. He is the Holy spirit. He is everything. He is a giant, right. In that aspect. Um, and the way I, have come to understand that is like, yes, he's a giant, but as he comes to us or as we go to him, he, he, there's a reason why God sent his son to earth to be a human and feel all human emotions. Right. He, that's, that's why he was that size. Right. Because as we walk through our lives as an adult, God isn't Jesus and God, they're not, watching us right they don't want to just be sitting there watching us fail watching us succeed they want to be experiencing it with us they want to be there through all every step of everything every struggle every accomplishment everything that that, that's how i've been able to interpret that as an adult wow you know there were uh we talked uh before uh this interview um of a of a very popular movie heaven is uh, for real about a little boy who went into surgery and he didn't clinically die as it appears to be with your case obviously we were assuming at that point given the nature of your your skin and how you appeared your heart had stopped but he had this vision of jesus and not a vision well i don't think it's a vision but i Yours is not a vision. You were there. I mean, you were, you know, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So you were, you were there and, and, and it's absolutely spectacular that he's giving you these toys from the perspective of a child. That's what he's doing. So Liam, a lot of people, uh, they email us or they communicate with us in some way about the loss of a child. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they wonder and about that child, or maybe it was an unborn child where that child is. And you were with Jesus at that point. I mean, you were right there, right? I mean, there was no journeying through a, a tunnel or anything of that nature. He gave you that kind of that playroom, but he was right there with you at that instant that you have any recollection from that accident? Would that be that? Yeah. Would that? Yeah. So yeah, I'm, absolutely. Yeah. So, and what's striking, I think, about that, Liam, is that is that even though he's this he's an Almighty God, and that's how he appears. He became very personal to you, but he gave you the thing that. <laughs> that would just entertain you as a child, the very thing that you would yeah, want. It, exactly. And <laughs> it's, it, it, it makes it like, I guess like how he made it personable towards a child, right? Like right. giving a child a, a giant truck with a big old boat that I would want now. Right. <laughs> he, he, he gave what a child desired right then and there and then he as i like i told like as you said like when he put his arm around me like helped me to understand as a three-year-old that like like those are earthly desires right like, yeah I, I am your desire like and it was it was so clear 
And I think a takeaway for those who may have lost uh, a child uh, and the child caught in the innocence of that, you know, that moment where they no longer have a life in front of them, where they have uh, physically died, is that Jesus is right there, right there at that moment. And it took you a while, didn't it, for to really um, go there. You know, after, as you grew up, you know, um, you only uh, maybe a handful of your family knew about this uh, instance. But did when you do you have any recollection of when you came to when you came back to the world of um, of what that was like? Or did that is that a faded memory or, you know, where, where does your memory begin as a child? Yeah. So after that, I don't remember this part, but. Um, obviously like as a three-year-old coming back, like I didn't obviously, like I, so I, well, actually I can tell you what I do remember is when I came back, I do remember being in the hospital. Uh, so I actually came back to life before the ambulance came. Uh, I, <clears throat> the ambulance showed up and they, my, my parents told me I coughed up water, like at that instant, like right when the ambulance showed up. Uh, so they threw me in the ambulance, they brought me to the hospital and I, like the one thing that I remember is like, it, maybe they're giving me a shot or hooking me up to an IV. And I remember them rubbing this little like numbing gel on me. It was like a purple jelly. And like, that's the one thing I remember. Um, and then I remember getting transferred to a new hospital. And I remember getting breakfast with my, my parents in the morning. And that that's what I, that that's where the memory ends as far as afterwards. Um, but even then I, still wasn't understanding like what I had actually experienced. Right. Um, so I ended up telling my parents a few days afterwards, uh, and they're the ones that helped me to understand like what I had actually experienced. Cause I just started talking about, it. I said the, the man that was dressed in all white, like, yeah, he, he gave me all these cool toys. Like it was awesome. And they're like, <laughs> what? I'm like, yeah, like, yeah, like this, is, this guy gave me like all these like really neat toys. And like, what are you talking about? Like, it was a guy with, with a beard and sitting in a really big chair. And they're like, Liam, like that's Jesus. Like you saw Jesus. Like that's like you know when we go to church and like we pray and the man that's sitting on the big cross, like up on the altar, like that's Jesus. You met him, and that's when I was like, oh, like neat. <laughs> like okay, as a three year old, right? Still trying to grasp that idea. Um, it wasn't until I, you know, started getting older and I was like, and it clicked, right? I'm like, wow, like that was like, like a special event. Like it, it what that doesn't happen to everybody. <laughs> no, no. And, and especially as a child, I mean, uh, I no, not how many children really die, thankfully, but you were, uh, without brain activity underwater, so physiologically you should have had some brain damage, but, but there was no brain damage. Was there? No, no, there mm -hmm. wasn't. Um, in fact, like the doctor said, there was zero scientific reason as to why there wasn't brain damage. Um, they came to the conclusion that, uh, perhaps the reason why I wasn't full of water was because uh, infants and toddlers, their clavicle closes as a defense mechanism, so they don't fill up with water. Um, but I was still at the bottom of a pool, right? Um, without oxygen. So, but as far as that, they said that there was zero scientific reason as to why I was not brain dead. Wow. Did you have time as you grew older, whatever point where you were praying or asking the Lord just, you know, why? And, you Absolutely. know, what, what, why did you save me? Mm -hmm. Um, and there's so many that don't come back. Did you ever go through that process? Yeah. And I, as a human being, I still ask myself that question sometimes. Um, as I've grown older, I've, I've started to, you know, come to like, understand like there is a reason and I, I am working towards that reason. I believe I'm getting really close. Um, but yeah, I remember praying as a kid every night for bed and thanking God for giving me this second chance. Like, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then those prayers started turning into why, why, why? Um, 
And then it kind of just grew as I got older and I matured uh, into just a different understanding, I guess. Um, and really uh, struggling, I would say, to search for like that reason, because I, as a three-year-old, like, it's not like he just sent me out on a mission, right? When it was, when that time was done, I, it, <clears throat> I got, I got very minimal conversational words as a three-year-old with Jesus. Um, so that, that question grew in my brain stronger and stronger every day and still does. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, it, it's public now. So, um, it's out there and people are being blessed right now, Liam, hearing your account and we've had uh some who have gone to heaven including yours truly who have had um exposure to children in heaven we had jim woodford who saw a nursery in heaven uh i saw children playing with angels in heaven when i had after i had died and and been in heaven with jesus um and so that's what it is one of the biggest questions we have you know uh or we get uh is that what happens with the children you know and you actually had to go somewhat through a cathartic process because you know you wanted to be a kid you wanted to grow up normally, and um, as soon as people mention you were the the boy who drowned in the pool and saw Jesus, uh, it's had to take you to a different level. I mean, it's not like you had it as an adult where you had the, you know, the the maturity really to process this. Yeah, absolutely. I remember growing up and like that. That story still gets told today. Um, I had actually I called my mom prior to this. And told her what was going on. She goes, wow, that's crazy. I just told your story five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it gets it gets told a lot. And growing up, it got told a lot. Um, I never liked being the center of attention. So like it was kind of, you know, a little awkward for me growing up um, because it wasn't something that I craved attention over like at all. Like I did, I didn't, I don't know, I was just growing up. I, I never really took it for granted, I guess you could say. Like it's... <clears throat> I never wanted that attention growing up. I wanted, yeah, wanted to be the normal kid. <laughs> to the kids or, or young people? I mean, the teens can be kind of cruel, especially during adolescence. Did anyone know at your school or others? Did it get, did word get out? Yeah. So I had told a couple people. Um, and I remember in grade school getting challenged on God. And I was always like, just the forefront, like, like, don't tell me God's not real. Um, and they'd be like, well, yeah, like, how do you know? And I'll be like, well, I'll tell you. Like, <laughs> ah. And and it was always as I was a little angry little boy, like in third grade. Right. <laughs> wow. Um, and uh, so I did share it in those instances. Um, as I grew older, like I definitely, I kept it to myself more as I grew up. Um, and, but I would share it with, with my friends who were non-believers, especially um, to, like I, I've always been big. It's like I, I want everybody to experience Christ, right? Like it's a life without Christ is quite literally just empty. Um, and I, I've always utilized that as like an opportunity to perhaps get somebody to at least think about it, right? Um, you know, telling a story might not get somebody to believe, but it's going to place a seed in their brain, and perhaps it'll grow, right? Well, you were kind of like a childhood evangelist. I mean, <laughs> you're like, not many kids can uh, have a have a talking point, you know, to talk about Jesus is like, yeah, Jesus is real. Um, but you had this uh, clincher, which was, I saw him. <laughs> mm -hmm. like, that, that, that in of itself is so evangelically, how could, I mean, I'm sure that there were some, um, you know, jaws that were dropped or, you know, yeah, like, absolutely. <laughs> did any of the, anyone challenge your story or say, no, 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 you were just imagining that or. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. 
I mean, it happened all the time. Like, I can't think of a specific instance, but yeah, I, I, I actually do remember a specific instance of an individual telling me like, it's impossible for you to remember that when you're three years old. And I was like, well, I do remember it. <laughs> yes. Like, I'm well, not, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's a pretty hard story to just, I guess, make up and roll with. Um, Cause it's never changed as I've gotten older. And it's not like you wanted that experience anyway. You wanted to be a normal kid. Yeah. I mean, it's not like you had a, you know, a child doesn't have a compulsion to say I met Jesus face to face. I mean, there may be uh, like like my son when he was growing up, you know, he had this really intimate experience with Jesus. But, you know, that was private for him and he didn't go to school and say, uh, you know, Jesus. Well, my daughter actually did tell somebody they needed to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But it's not normal as a kid. And and you had to, as you grew older then, you not only, you know, had to process this thing and from a adult's perspective, but looking now as an adult, what, you know, obviously you're here with us now, but what do you think God is using you for relative to this uh, to this story? How's it being used? What, why did he did he explain to you uh, why or anything like that that would uh, kind of give you a clear understanding? No. In fact, when I was in heaven, I got I got one sentence from Jesus. So, Liam, he told you one sentence. What did he say to you? Yeah. So as he had his arm drive around me and I looked at him and I again, like I said, I was, I was saying thank you. He, he looked me in the eyes and he said, no, Liam, thank you. I, I'm not ready for you yet. And then that's when I popped back into earth. Wow. That's amazing. That is absolutely incredible. But I was not given, like I said, I wasn't given a mission when, when that happened. Yeah. Well, I can tell you that one sentence for that presence with Jesus is exponentially uh, greater as a result of it coming from a child's perspective, I think. And I think you're going to find that from our audience and you already, uh, you know, from comments, you know, that they're saying this is I my my child needs to hear this. You know, my my teenager needs to hear this. Um, but also as an adult, we need to hear this Absolutely. because we need to know the goodness of God, right? We need yeah. to know that he's there, that he would be so magnanimous and so tender hearted to you that he would give you that those playthings. He wouldn't, you know, usher you into uh, you know, a ten foot tall angel to see, or even uh God on the throne, you know, of being this huge almighty figure he became very personal and very he did he you know the, there's the the bible verse uh and when jesus was being crowded out by children and the disciples uh wanted to get the children away from him and then he uh said this famous uh line in the bible which is suffer unto the children for theirs is the kingdom of god he has a tender heart for children doesn't he yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it's like we're in the Bible. It says like when you're you will come to heaven as a child, right? As a childlike yes. uh, emotion, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, and that's and that's so important, isn't it? Uh, to to come to the Lord with a childlike understanding, a childlike faith. As adults, we try to reason things out, and we run through these Liam on and on with our people that have shared with us and by the way it takes a lot of courage for people to come forward because uh you know and others have known that this is going to go public in a large way um that there are you know we have shared channels and we have a television program so this could conceivably go out to hundreds of thousands if not millions and so um you know, there may be, you know, somebody at the store who will say, hey, tell me about the time you uh, drowned as a kid and you met Jesus. But but that's you're you're kind of a, a, of a small family 
and we're a small family uh, of those who have had this experience directly with Jesus at the point of death. So what would you have to say to our audience maybe that might be saying, yeah, you know, I've gone through whatever and Jesus doesn't seem so real to me now. I haven't seen him. I, you know, if I saw him face to face, it would be one thing, but you know, I, I haven't. So any, any words for, for those who might kind of be doubting at this point? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in fact, so, you know, like growing up as a kid, like we believe in Santa Claus and it's always like, you know, seeing isn't believing, believing is seeing. Um, I still live by that, right? The reason why I believe in God and I put my trust in Christ isn't because I saw him. And in fact, as I, as I grew through, as I grew up and matured, like there was a time in my life where I questioned my faith. Um, even though I had met Jesus, right. Because I was sin- I was in a sinful life as we're all sinners and, you know, struggling to repent as a 20 year old at college, you know, making those mistakes that lead me to believing lies about myself that the evil one plants into my brain. Right. Um, and that led me down a track to where I, I strongly questioned my faith, um, and I took it upon myself because I, I started meeting with a, uh, a Christian group leader at my college. Um, and I, I came to him and I was, and I was, I was really distraught um, because I had never questioned my faith and I had never questioned whether God was real. And for the first time in my life, I was. And it wasn't like a, like it's easier to just not, it was, it was a deep, like, burden like on my heart like I, I was like i knew i was doing something wrong but i was, was so struggling to believe and like and in my brain like having this experience meeting jesus like in my brain like how can you possibly be having these thoughts when you know like you quite literally know and uh it, it took a substantial amount of of willpower in myself to uh basically unwind the lies that I was believing in my brain to reroute my attention and understand that the only way is to quite literally just, you have to repent. You have to turn away. Um, it, a Bible verse that I have quite literally lived by my entire life is depart from evil and do good, seek peace and pursue it. It's in the book of Psalms. Uh, and the reason I love that one so much is because it doesn't talk about it's, it's telling the way I understand it is running from evil your entire life means you're never pursuing God. It only means you're running away from something. Um, so if any of you guys, if, if you are quite literally, if you're, all you're doing is running from your sins and just trying to get away from the devil, what, you, what needs to be done is you have to reroute, stop running and chase God. You you have to pursue him. You can't just run away from the bad. You have to chase the good. You have to repent. You have to, you have to change your lifestyle. Like it, it is a, it, that is how you find God. Um, seeing him isn't how you find him. Mm. This is great. I am blessed. All of us are blessed who are able to experience this, experience this and be able to share it with people. But that's not why I believe. I, I believe because I was in a dark place. I was, it, I had a heavy burden on my heart and I was able to reconnect with God by simply like just honestly repenting, not just, you know, praying for forgiveness every night and then continuing to do the same things over and over again. I had to reroute and start pursuing God and pursuing Christ and putting him into my daily life, my, my daily activities, my everything, right. It, it, and this is something that I have quite literally learned in the last year. Mm. Um, as, so I'm 22 right now. Uh, and that's where I've been able to find peace and like quite just like actual happiness. Like it is you, pursuing God is how you get there. It's not running away from something bad. That's such a great, great point because it's not really, if, if we, if, everybody had the opportunity to see Jesus, it wouldn't make them a Christian, right? I mean, it doesn't, it really doesn't make them a believer. 
necessarily. Um, even Jesus, when he gave the, the uh, story of the rich, um, the rich man who was in hell and the beggar who was with Abraham, and the rich man in hell said, uh, will you send Abraham to tell my relatives that you're real so they'll believe? And Jesus said, if they wouldn't believe the prophets, then they won't believe that. So, you know, it's it has to be, we have to each come to terms uh, our, on our own way that yes, I'm going to surrender. And also, you know, the Bible also uh, notes that, um, and this is one of the beatitudes, blessed are those who who have not seen and yet believe, you know, and we've seen, right? So uh, in a sense, you know, what people think that, well, you're more blessed because you've seen him, but really those who are believing in their heart and have not seen Jesus are, are in a sense more blessed. Yeah, 100%. Uh, like yeah. those who are able to live that Christ-like life, obviously not Christ, but actually follow that path and not veer from it, is it? I admire them 100. percent Like it's, it is a, it's a lifestyle. It's not a hobby. It, it is a, it, it's like you. If you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out. Like you have to either be all in or all out. You can't just play the best of both sides, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So well said from a point of a, uh, a, a childlike faith that has grown into a man and uh, speaks from uh, the tenderness of heart that uh, Jesus revealed to you as you, uh, as you became a man, as a young man today. So I'm going to ask you, Liam, to pray for our audience. And there are those that are listening now that watching this and they've been touched by your story, your account, but they need a touch of, uh, from, from the Lord. And some of them are saying now, I just want to see him like you saw him. If I could, if I could do that, then I would, it would be fine. It would be good. And some are just saying, I, I don't even know if I'm going to heaven on the day that I die. I don't know that. I don't know if I'm a believer. And some are saying, I'm not a believer, but I tuned in and I was curious about this and I'm just like, okay. But I kind of think now that maybe I want to, I want to do this Christian thing. So would you, would you be willing to pray for our audience for all of those different needs and that people have? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. All right. Say the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we, we sit here and we, we pray today to ask you to help all of us and all of those who are in desperate need of your love to allow us to open up our hearts to you so you are able to enter into us and heal our wounds so we can actually feel your love. We pray for those who are struggling with repentance. We ask you to, to please guide them towards your path so they, they may experience experience the love that you have to offer and the pure joy and happiness. We, we pray to ask those who are, who are running away from the bad, but failing to pursue you. We, we ask you to please guide them and show them that pursuing you is the only way to achieve, achieve true happiness and, and experience your love. We, we pray for all the non-believers that they will find you and develop that relationship with you. And we, we, we just pray for everybody who is struggling with their faith that they come to the understanding that once they believe that they will be able to see you. We ask you to just heal everybody who needs their wounds healed and heal their hearts. They may find you. We pray, pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And if you prayed uh, for the first time to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, very simply, uh, you know, saying I've, I've fallen short, I've sinned, I've, you know, I've failed. Uh, Lord, become Lord of my life. And I know that you sacrificed yourself on the cross for me. And I just want you to I surrender myself to you. If you've done that, then please uh, message us at randyk.org in the contact uh, section. Uh, we also have in the con under the contact session, if you have 
any struggles uh, that you need somebody to talk with, we have three 800 numbers uh, and we have uh, people that we've partnered with other ministries who are on there uh, 24-7. So don't let you know the night go by when you're having these thoughts, uh, dark thoughts. You know, talk to somebody and let us know so we can, uh, you know, we can help you uh, to uh, uh, better understand what this walk in Christ is. So, uh, Liam, this has been phenomenal. Uh, thank you so much for sharing this life-changing story. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I, I feel very blessed to be able to, to share this with you and, and with the audience and and be able to share that story for anybody who needs to be able to hear it. Well, it'll go far and wide. And uh, this is a story I think uh, uh, mom and dad, you should bring your children to maybe. Uh, maybe not when they're just, uh, you know, three years old or whatever, but let them see this this uh, child who met Jesus. And, uh, and then use that as a talking point with your children to talk about Jesus and that he's real. So... Um, Thank you again, Liam, and uh, we will uh, now tell you some great news, and that is, if you are indeed in Christ Jesus, be of good cheer, because heaven is in your future. Until next time, take care, and God bless. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe, and if you'd like further information, go to our website at randyk.org where our mission is simple, to share the great news of God's love.